I was born at 265 Dogsort Road in the room over what is now the barber shop and what is more I have to guess a little bit of it but I think it's because my mother came from a Baptist family with a clergyman as her grandfather, Baptist clergyman and my father came from a Church of England family and I know there's a clergyman somewhere and I think it was his grandfather, my great grandfather and the Baptists don't christen their children until they're about 12 and I can only guess that my father wasn't prepared to wait all that time and by luck the King's School connections in those days were very strong Reverend Bertie Baxter was just retiring that month as headmaster of King's School but he was an Anglican clergyman and so he and I've told this obviously I do not remember it he came and christened me in what is now the barber shop and my sister she was also born in the room over the barber shop I've got a vague childhood memory but when you're four you can just vaguely remember it and I know something about them telling me it was the doctor arriving and I was having my breakfast and I could see somebody going up the stairs and so uh, we were both born in that room which for many years has been the living room of the flat Obviously it has changed a lot since, but what I am very conscious of, because it was so recent, is that Peterborough had changed more in the period about 20, no, about 30 years before I was born. If you think that the whole of Gladstone Street, Broadway, etc., you look at the dates on the houses, go out here and have a look at the dates on the houses, they're all from about 1870 to about 1910. So Peterborough must have trebled in size before the First World War. Then, in between the two wars, there was a considerable expansion. But one thing that is very interesting, I for the first time actually studied the details on the War Memorial at All Saints Church and I noticed that there are twice as many people that died in the 1418 war as in 3945 but if you look at about over half of Park Road, Queen's Drive, Queen's Garden, Grimshaw Road, all of them, all of those were built between the wars. So the town must have doubled in size between the wars, and yet the number killed was halved. So the death rate, in round figures, must have been four times in the first world what it was in the second then what has happened is we've had growth in chunks for what a better word and I know by talking to other people is that you get new communities and nothing wrong with that but they become almost like though they're not a village they become more like a village you go to the Hamptons, and I always cheekily say to people, oh, you live in the Brickfields. But they're a totally new community with, with their own schools, and there's always a problem with cars, because people live only a mile away, and they don't let little John or little Joan walk, do they? You see them taking number of times I hear somebody saying 
I'm doing the school run. It might mean they're walking, or, but it's often as not that they're getting in the car and driving half a mile or mile. So, you know, that's one of those things. You went to King's School, didn't you? I went, I, I went to King's, in fact, I went to King's twice. I was near enough five. Then when my father died, I know exactly when that was, he died in 1940. So I went to the Masonic School, which is a charity school in North London, boarding school. And I went there, and that's how I first got my military training, because when you were, went to the senior school, the age of 11, you had to join the London Rifle Brigade Cadets. And then, after, I think it'd be two years in the sixth form, not quite sure what, definitely wasn't doing as well as I should have done, but uh, my mother uh, applied, actually went to see the deputy head, said yes, I went back to King's School, which was one of the best things ever happened to me academically. So I because you could go there at work at night. I always remember, I've only once, though I've been uh, as doing zoology later at Birmingham after I the army, but I've only once done a complete, perfect dissection of a cat. The headmaster went up into, he used to wander around the building because it was a boarding house there as well, but those of us who were day boys could go back, try to go back into the laboratory, or I don't know what it's called, a laboratory, whatever it was, where we did our dissections. I was 7, 7.30 at night. I had found a dead cat, and I cut it up while it was still warm, and the headmaster came in, and it was a perfect dissection. I'd never done one since when I was at university. I'd literally got it from there to there without a break. And I got it round the wall. There's nobody else in that evening. I was measuring it with a foot rule of measuring that. And so then I put it in a big glass jar of formalin to preserve it. And I can tell you now, I put that jar in what is now the Park Road Nursery School, 241 Park Road. I put that jar under the bath to keep it. And I think it was my mother, that somebody in the family threw it away while I was in the army. Threw my cat away, just because he hadn't got any bones or any skin. It was just the inside. But there we are. It wasn't particularly good at zoology. And, uh, but it was King's School, and it really was that helped me academically at the next stage because when I came out of the army I went to university I got a chance to go and work at Norman Wrights and soon after that the deputy head Mr Larratt saw me and he said now you're studying surveying do you do a lot of law? I said, 50%. I said, at each stage, the surveyors or auctioneers, the exams, and then surveyors exams, are in three stages. At each stage, you have six papers, of which three are law. And I didn't know till then that Denham Lara, as well as having a maths degree, he'd had an aunt who had died, and she'd left him some money so he'd taken a, a year sabbatical from the school and became a barrister. And so I used to go to 198 Lincoln Road, which is where Denham Larratt lived, where his wife actually st took the King School kindergarten to. So I used to go there, I couldn't tell you which night, but one night a week. And law became my best subject. And then, in fact, so much so that I passed my auctioneer's exams and then the surveyor's exams that went with it. And then when I went out to Nigeria, 
I was given a chance to be a company secretary and so I do it by correspondence course but my legal training was so much better than the others the fact that I changed directions didn't matter and so I actually qualified as a chartered company secretary while I was out there and then when I was back here and I was running my own business in Westgate I was asked to teach valuations at what we then call the tech, they now call the regional college so I did that I think one night a week during the term and a chap called Ken Gosling who was one of the law lecturers, I don't know how many law lecturers they had he went down sick and they telephoned me and said could I stand in for him and so I said well I better find out so I went round to the college and had a look at the syllabus said yes so I actually taught law only for, for I think one or two lessons a week but ironically enough my elder daughter now age 62 I think it was 62 this year she was working for Bully Davy the accountants and she was in my law class um, how would you describe what school was like were they strict oh yeah yeah we didn't have any of this stupid business I think it was much easier that in fact I will tell you one of my favourite stories that while I think it happened while at the King's School but I didn't see it happen but I knew of it from friends close hand the there was a, a, I don't know if it was a staff room or what overlooking the quad at the back of the King's School main building and there was a sixth form room I think it was above that and the head was visiting that staff room or something and he saw a young boy hanging outside upside down out of that upstairs window and I could tell you exactly what Hornsby said he said somebody go up there and tell them that six forms allowed to enforce corporal punishment not capital punishment but you know I remember when I was still at the Masonic school I remember at junior school I don't know what I've done wrong nothing and we wore shorts at the junior school having to stand on a bench slap the back of your thighs um, and it was all so much easier if you a naughty boy the prefects were allowed I think they were allowed to slap but not only the, if only the headmaster at King's or Masonic School only the headmaster could evict the claim caning was definitely headmaster's privilege but so not when they say, people say corporal punishment no um, staff and I think prefects could actually um, tan, smack you and I, I think it was much better all this uh, they drag it out in the army it was much easier strict discipline is much easier to live with if you're wrong you do something wrong you get caught you get punished bang finish it's, it's the do-gooders that's what it is you're a traditionalist yeah I mean well I've actually said that people to blame as taking non-serious attitude obviously are the plumbing fraternity because if you sneaked you were given the bog wash now do you know what the bog wash is? right the bog wash is if somebody was a sneak you took him in the toilet you put his head down and you pulled the chain now these silly little things are handled no good at all so it's the plumbing fraternity that have had a lot to do with that softening up I'm on the OPA which is the Old Petrobergen Association been on that committee for God I had a break obviously when I was in Nigeria but I do know I was on the committee before that so that's what 60 years ago I'm obviously not very active now 
so if it, because I, I don't know how to do these modern gadgets th these remote control committee meetings I can't don't know how to attend them right. and I have exactly the same thing with the Royal Naval Association you know have remote control or whatever you call it so uh, no, it's no good I'm whether it's a genuine excuse or just laziness, but either way, I said I'm not going to get round to doing those. Was it unusual to be travelling to London during the war? I think the answer is yes, and there was a bomb dropped. Well, the funny thing was there was a bomb dropped, I think it was that day in Peterborough. So I said we at least got an excuse. But I agree with you. Uh, I'd mentioned that there were only two people from Peterborough at the school and there used to be a special train from Bushy and Oxy uh, to Euston at the end of every term out of those 700 boys there were only I think certainly weren't nine or ten I think there were only about half a dozen catching a northern train from King's Cross so you say there weren't many from out of town mm -hmm. and I can see what you're implying there's a bit of logic saying why the hell uh, in fact there was I think it was the term before I got there but there was an oil bomb dropped in the grounds and it certainly wasn't I was there of the school it didn't do any real damage but boys having got a reasonable sense of humour the, there was another charity school very near us, the Caledonian school, and Hitler's mates dropped an incendiary bomb there and created havoc. And we as boys, so it shows Hitler's not such a bad chap. What the hell were the Scots doing down here? You know, schoolboy humour, just the job. It was nearer than usual since Peter I didn't get them you've only got to consider that when a, a German plane flew over and it flew over um, Werner Flyder's factory and they didn't take the cover off the, the anti-aircraft gun that's also a standard local joke you presumably heard well Baker Perkins, it's now called, was Werner Flydra. I mean, I lived with my grandmother during the war and for several years afterwards. And the people next door, though the lady's name was Mrs. Pelmore, and her nephew was by then managing director of Baker Perkins was known as Owen Pelmore, but I was told by the people who worked there his correct name was Otto Flydra. So it's not surprising when a German plane went over, he didn't bomb them, and they didn't get the cover off their anti-aircraft gun. The only thing we did see, I was there when a doodle bug went over. That was one of the things that I do remember we were all standing watching this aeroplane it goes boom 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 we've been told that would happen and that if the engine stopped then it dropped on you straight away the staff were shouting get down the subways and I'm fairly sure that I'm right still because we talked about it that we weren't going to miss the excitement were we and funnily enough I don't know whether going down the subways was any good. If it dropped straight on you, I think you'd have had it anyway. That was towards the end of the war, about 19... Because I was there in the middle of it, about 44, I think, somehow. There's a lady called Miss Wigner, who is in the photographs of the junior school. She was a head teacher of the junior school. She was also the head of the... Uh, Cubs, and she was also 
head of the junior church at Park Road Baptist. So you saw her seven days a week. But that is not only that. When I was at the Masonic School, the Children's Special Service Mission used to run a holiday camp, I think it was called, uh, for schools in the summer holidays. And one of the, I think they were called officers, but obviously they were volunteers, but one of the people in one of the camps I went to two years running was a bloke called Gurney Wigner. We're miles away from Peterborough, no connection with Peterborough. It was Miss Wigner's brother. So uh, I said to my friends, I think she's God's representative on earth. Uh, one of the things that I first learned a little bit of business experience, we had food rationing. And I remember, because I liked eggs more than fruit, on egg day I would have two or three eggs because I'd swap them for other people's oranges or apples. And then also uh, some boys, we had the pocket money we got was regulated. I think it was 10 shillings a term, doesn't sound much nowadays, so 50 pence for 13 weeks. But I found that very often some boys weren't going to use all their coupons. So I could buy some sweet coupons down at Bushy at the school and sell them at a profit when I got back to Peterborough. You were in Whitehall on B Day? Yes, I was. Now that was really, as far as I'm concerned, it was sheer luck and unexpected. George Nicholson was another boy at the Masonic School. And we were told on VE Day in the senior school we could have the day off. It was only the day. So I couldn't possibly get back to Peterborough and back again. And my friend George said, would you like to come with me to see my mother in Southgate? So I thought it was smashing. So we got to Southgate and his mother, instead of taking us in and giving us a cup of tea, got us straight onto the tube train up to Whitehall. Although I only vaguely remember it, but I do remember, I don't think we actually saw Churchill or someone properly, because the balcony would be over him. We must have been fairly early there. But I can say that I, I think it is true if you think of my age now there won't be many we were 13 then there won't be many people who were that young then so anybody that was say 20 then has got to be 96 by now so i don't think there'll be many of us alive that were actually in whitehall on ve day in, in whitehall is full chock-a-block full mm. So, you know, it's sort of standing, and of course Whitehall's such a big place, and you've got sort of Parliament Square around the corner, so the number of people actually in Whitehall, I'm going to guess, I've no idea, was probably half or two thirds of the total that were in the crowd. But because George's mother had obviously got us there quite early in the day, I have no idea what time the speech was. In fact, there was, I'm almost sure that there was one minister came through in a car, whereas they had sort of underground systems or something, even in those days, for getting into Downing Street. I don't think you had to go all the way around the block. Uh, and we, I think that was Herbert Morrison. But funnily enough, George Nicholson and I were obviously pretty good friends. And going back much more recently, only about 1960, I think, about, about five years later, no, a bit more, 15 years later, I mean, uh, 
I was in Nigeria and the phone rang and it was George Nicholson. I said, God, how much is this call costing you? He said, very little. My office is only around the corner from yours. He was working out there. I went to university um, straight after I came out of the army. So I went to Masonic School to King's School and I could have gone to university then but I knew we'd got to do two years in the army and because of my cadet training I didn't realise this time I sure was I was quite keen on getting back into uniform full time so uh, I went straight from school um, and did my two years and then came home in the summer and went to Birmingham so this was your national service? I did my national service, yeah. Okay, how, how would you describe that? Was it a formative experience? Oh, I, I, I thought it was excellent. I really, I enjoyed it. And I know I mentioned it earlier on, I think it's very wrong that they're keeping the naughty boys out of the army now. Because uh, by and large, their standard of integrity is certainly as good, if not better than a lot of the professionals I've met. They're very loyal to each other. You know, and so, uh, but no, so, uh, I say I had the year there and got off the job in the surveyor's office, so I, it was part of the application for Nigeria. The chairman of the company uh, was interviewed for, I knew they were managing agents of the Lagos Building Society. So uh, he actually phoned me and said uh, there was a short list of, I think, four couples. We had to go for medicals to London. Uh, our wives even had to go for a medical uh, the managing director of the company had flown over from Nigeria to meet each couple and he phoned me and said uh, they'd given the job to somebody else but he was also secretary of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce which he was thinking of retiring from, would have been interest. I said, yes. Didn't hear another word from him until, and because of what happened, I could tell you it must have been about two weeks later, I had a phone call from him one afternoon, the same bloke. He said, never mind about this possibility of the Chamber of Commerce, are you still interested in the original job? I said, yes. He said, well, the man that we offered it to we thought he accepted it. We booked his flight. We've actually booked a flat to rent for him and his wife. And now he said he's not coming. And that is for, and he told me what the date was. He said, would you still like it? I said, yes. But I have to give, I think it was 28 days notice to the development corporation. He said, that's why I'm telephoning you and not waiting to have written a letter. You've got, I think it was an hour, it was not two hours anyway, to get your notice in. So I got home that evening and said to my wife, we're leaving, we're off to Nigeria. You, you mentioned the Development Corporation, that's the Stevenage Development Corporation. Yeah. Um, could you quickly describe uh, what you did there, please? Yes. Well, it did me a lot of good because in my present jobs I've obviously dealt with town hall people etc. and it's a help to know what bureaucracy is all about. And so I was in the estate agent's office, estate agency, managing properties etc. Uh, but something I'd never come across as I've been in private practice you see before that you clocked off and I think it was five o'clock on a Friday you know whereas 
before that, when I worked at Norman Wright's in Peterborough, um, I could say to somebody who phoned me up, deal with property, oh, well, uh, I should be behind the bar at the Pittsburgh Arms at Caster. If you'd like to come and see me there, or uh, another night, blokes, and I'd see somebody on a and, and they obviously even in those days they were selling new houses so I did that as I say so when I got this offer for a job in Nigeria and I'm not joking I couldn't have shown you Lagos from half of the world but it was a Nigerian that was working in the development corporation had actually said to me Langford you're always saying you want to get back to private practice the job here advertised in Lagos. I said, where the hell's that? I had no idea. So uh, went out there, and most people do one tour, which we vary from a year to 18 months. I did four tours, a total of six years. Great life. We actually had to do our own valuations. So one day a week, we would go out in a company car with a company driver, sometimes my own, but usually a Nigerian director would be with me. And we would do the valuations of probably half a dozen properties a week. I suppose it, it was a combination of if you can imagine people working in a building society here, but add the valuations bit of property management, we collected rent for a few people. Not a lot of that, but some. So it was a state agency and a building study all put into one. I think there was a, a garage underneath. We were on the first floor of 1117 Tolubu Street, Lagos. And on the second floor was Irving and Bonner solicitors. Thoroughly enjoyed it. My elder son, Nowadays, you don't call people white and black and so forth, but they did. And they would say he was the first white Nigerian. He was born two days after independence. So you were there at the time of independence? Yeah. I remember it well. And I, and we still celebrated in Peterborough. We haven't done the last two years, because of all the, which was a pity because last year was 60 years. And though there is a new national anthem, which I must admit I don't know, but I know the old one. Nigeria, we hail thee, my home, my native land. Well, unfortunately, there have been some falling out of the Christians and the Muslims, which definitely did not happen before independence, but soon after independence, and I do remember this well, there was a chap called Inaharo and one called Wallowo, and I forget which went which where, but they both tried to lead a coup and one was arrested in Nigeria and the other had run away to England but got arrested there. And a friend of mine called Chief of Gundipe, I knew quite well, I remember the exact conversation. I said, Agundipe, why didn't you shoot them resisting arrest? And he said, but they didn't resist arrest. I said, that wasn't a question. About four and a half years later, because of what I've just told you, I had just left Nigeria for the last time. There was another coup run by the same two blokes who served their prison term and they shot all the cabinet. One bloke, I think, was away out, I think, I think it was a foreign minister, but somebody was in England, but the rest of the cabinet were all shot. And I said to him, if you have a, a coup, the loser had to be shot, because if not, they'll do it again, and they did. But, you know, I, I used to socially mix with Muslims and Christians, and I didn't realise that if I understand it right, the rules in rules don't actually say 
you mustn't touch alcohol, but you say you mustn't drink much of it. So, so what they did at dinners, you didn't see some people having a pint like we do here, and some just having a small glass or nothing to drink. Everybody, a small bottle was in the price of your meal. I joined a Masonic Lodge out there. And you would see some people got the Quran, some people got the Bible. No problem. I might be able to show you a photograph of my mother lodge. There's a photograph, there's only three white men. We used to all sit and have a meal together. And then we'd often go and have a drink at a bar somewhere else. We all mix mix together perfectly happily. Obviously we know that just as we got the Northern Ireland trouble here, we used to, we still come across from here the Indians and Pakistanis have got the trouble down the bottom. But Nigeria didn't seem to have anywhere that was like that at the time. But when independence comes, of course then some of the boys want a bit more power. Well, I got married the first time here. First time I was married at St John's Church. In fact, uh, I was working, that's why I was working at Norman Wrights, and the, the chief cashier at Wyman Abbott solicitors the other side of the road. He got a young daughter who just left the county school, and she was going nursing and so she was working there temporarily. So she carried on to go to the nursing place in Northampton, I think it was. But she only stayed there for a few months and she married me. And we were married for, I think it was 31 years. And only last, not um, yesterday, but Sunday, but previous week, I was having an ice cream in the park with that wife one of our daughters, one of her daughters, and two husbands. We're still all friends. 31 years, yeah. I've been married 27 years this time. Three for the first marriage, one for the second. I decided it was time to pack up. I got a chance to go further there, but I didn't want to get locked in, if that's the right word, um, because if I'd stayed there, I would have to have sent my children to private school in England. And if suddenly I would need to move, it would have been difficult. We did send them to private school, the junior school, when we got back anyway. We'd already booked a holiday somewhere on the Mediterranean, me and my wife and three kids. And while we were out there, my mother telephoned me to say there'd been an advert for a firm of estate agents who were looking for a qualified man because they wanted to open a practice in Peterborough. So I said to her, can you get me an appointment? They said yes. And it turned out that was William H. Brown and by luck, I was coming back from a holiday, I couldn't tell if it was the Friday or what, but it was the end of a week, and I was meant to be starting with it, Phillips Electrical the, f the next week, but it was a bank holiday. So on the bank holiday, I went up to Sleaford, and was interviewed, I think by all three partners, which was Herbert Brown, his son and his nephew he offered me a job and I accepted it. So I started at Phillips but gave a notice more or less straight away. I don't know how much you can tell me about the Freemasons. Oh, um, somebody asked me to define it. And I said it's quite simple. It's interdenominational monotheism. It's the only organisation I know of that believes you worship God in whichever way you think fit. And if you go into the temple at Ellendon, you will make Sikhs, Muslims, 
not many Jews there now, but it used to be a lot of Jews. And I was not a Mason, but when I was a young man, I remember there was a discussion on the radio. We didn't have television in those days. And the chief rabbi of England was a lady, Julia Neuberger. Somebody asked her what she thought about Freemasonry. And she said, I dare not comment because if I said anything rude, half my congregation would walk out. But it's varied a lot. I mean, I say at the moment, obviously I'm a one-man band, so I don't have a lot of staff. So I'll probably do as much immigration surveys as anything. That's surveying a house for somebody to bring their wife over from Pakistan for sake of argument. Or I done one the other day where he's coming from, replies got to go to Kathmandu. Um, I don't remember all the capitals, I have to look that up to get them addressed in the right place. I do those. Um, there, there's a dispute on the boundary I'm dealing with. Don't do much property management now. That has gone down over the years because my clients are all getting older and sold their stuff. So I don't manage any. I don't manage any properties now. The last one was sold only a few months ago. But when I was in Westgate, I managed about two hundred properties. But then I had a staff of nine or ten. Oh. I say I'm going to stop work when Mrs. Thatcher sends for me. And I had an argument with her when I last saw her. I used to be a very keen Tory worker. I always say I'm slightly to the right of Thatcher. I really do remember the last conversation I had with her when she came to Peterborough and there were, I couldn't tell you what, five or six of us were stood near the entrance door to be introduced to her when she arrived. And she said, hello to the first, I think, one or two people. And she came to me and she said, I know that man, before anybody could say anything. So I said, and we had an argument last time we met, and she said, I argue with nobody, and walked on to the next person. When she went out of the earshot, one of the people standing next to her, I don't know which one, said, what does she mean by that? Well, I, said, I think she meant, only that cheeky basket Smith would argue with me. But I remember being in the club when the boys voted her out, and that was bad. Because I used to be uh, vice chairman of the political committee in St Stephen's Club in Westminster, the Westminster Tory Club. And everybody swore their dying loyalty. But I've got lots of Labour friends as well. It happens in all parties. Everybody's loyal, but sudden a bit of power grabbing comes in. And somebody goes that way, that way. If she was visiting the club or just visiting Peterborough, then we would probably have a little welcoming party. But I've been a member of the Con Club. Oh. Well, certainly ever since I got back from Nigeria, or very soon after that. Because that was the good old days when bars didn't open till six o'clock, so I could shut my office in Westgate at 5.30, sort out any bits and pieces. If I left at about quarter to six, I'll be standing outside the door by about five, six, waiting for them to let me in. Oh, the sea cadets had a great fun. And then, funnily enough, there was a, a bloke I knew quite well, a very good friend of mine. I think he wanted the job, and I got plenty else to do, the Conservative Party, etc. So I retired at that stage, and again stayed out of the picture until somebody out of the blue got me into the British Legion. I had to go and get, buy myself a bowler hat and a rolled umbrella. Did you meet Prince Philip? Oh, I did, the yes. The oh, I, I ought to have told you that, yes. Because I, I shan't forget that. He's the only member of the family I've ever met. Whether he knew the answer to the question, well, I guess he did. Well, I guess he'd done his homework, I don't know. But it was when they were opening the Crescent, he came up he and the Queen came up the steps. Then they're on the flat piece, and we were on the right hand side, or as far as they're concerned, on the left. And 
she Gary Morgan he this was the fo obviously a agreed format and he stopped to talk to one or two people but the very first cadet I was first but he didn't speak to me he spoke to the cadet looked at his cap badge and said do you know what that cap badge stands for the cadet said no sir so he turned around to me and said do you I said yes T.S. Gildenberg, the ancient name of Peterborough, the Golden City. If I hadn't known it either, whether he was known, we don't know. My guess he'd done his homework. You were the president of the Peterborough Royal British Legion. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and obviously I still do things when, when they want me to. So what are the responsibilities of the president? Mainly, I suppose, to attend parades and functions of that sort of thing. I like the local community, so I've always come back to this patch. I was there uh, with sort of three hats on, for what a better word. As past president of the British Legion, I attend these things, but I'm an active member of the Royal Naval Association. Yeah. And that was a Royal Naval Association on the mills, but equally, because it was a VE Day celebration, I decided to do something different. The wreath I laid was on behalf of my father and two of his three brothers. So three out of the four died in the First or Second War. So the answer to which I represent is the answer, all three. There must be lots of opportunities all the time. And just something, the right one comes, they say, yes, please. When the younger son was a sea cadet, and I went to pick him up one evening and the chairman of the British Legion at the time was standing outside the customs house and he, he said, we're looking for a president of the British Legion. Yeah. Yeah. He, he always cries as if he hasn't got food and he often has. Are you tempted to retire? Well, retiring from work, you mean? Or, well, I, I think, I've often said this, I don't think it really arises. A lot of my work has ceased. I'm making no effort to get any more in. You can see these are jobs that have come in in the last couple of weeks. When I'm past it, or not giving the right service, the public will stop instructing me, won't they? You know, I, I thought, I wonder what was going to happen, funnily enough, after this lockdown business, because suddenly, having done one or two immigration surveys most weeks for several years, I didn't get one for about a couple of months. Then I got the odd one, and then I got six in a week. In fact, this week at the moment I got none booked. But I did three last week. Yeah. So, you know, the boys will decide. It is usually the boys, but occasionally it's a girl. The other thing is, I am physically slower. If somebody wants me to, I haven't done a job out of town for, oh, I think six months. But I did last year, I think, did two down in Huntington must be connected with each other. I said, okay, I don't mind going there, provided you pay me a slightly higher fee and you meet me at Huntington Station. I'm not going to drive down there. I will catch a train, you can meet me at the station. If it's too far away, I say no. You do everything for yourself still, don't you? Well, you see, I had to do a very strict test, you know. The test I had to take the present renewal, which would be about 18 months ago, I think, the driving licence. A test much stronger than the one a normal. To give an idea, I'd actually, because I thought I'd got to be, I'd take some driving lessons. And the lady from the driving school, I actually said to her, I know I'll have to pay you, I think I'd like you to come with me. 
because I got to go to a, a church hall to meet the inspector near Spalding. So when I got to drive there in the first place, and the lady, I don't know, I suspect she did it on purpose. She um, came here, I said, well, shall I drive you there? She said, but yes, drive me in my car, not yours. She said, because I haven't got a, a parking permit or something. And I thought, I didn't know whether that was relevant. And I think it probably wasn't. I think she wanted me to see how I get on driving somebody else's car. Because when we got there, they asked me a few questions. Then they came out and said, right, you have to go in our car. So I had to drive a strange car into the town, then round the outskirts, and uh, then back into this church hall for tests and things. And I don't know what, what an hour, hour and a half, quite a lot. But uh, I will say they handed me a letter then and there saying something like we have no hesitation in saying that he is fit to drive. Uh, there's a note underneath, we think he should make more careful use of his working mirrors. But you know, fair enough. I do walk the paper shop, which is over half a mile away. So I go there at about eight o'clock every morning. So I reckon it's about over a mile anyway, the return trip walking. You said that you wanted to keep working until you die. I think the expression you used was um, that you would keep working until you die and go to heaven and meet Jesus of Mohammed. Yeah. Well, you see, that's assuming we don't know who's in charge up there. Now, let me tell you one of my favourite true stories about that. Not straight after she died, it would be, I'm going to guess, but two or three years ago. Do you know Mr. Wahi Walla? He was leading Sikh. And I said to him, you're neutral on whether it's better to be a Christian or a Muslim, aren't you? He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, well, we used to say that when Mrs. Thatcher goes to heaven, she'll go up there and she'll see Jesus sitting next to God. And she'll say, who's that sitting in my chair? Now, the Muslims and the Christians are equally song. So when she went up there a few weeks ago, she must have seen Jesus in one side, Muhammad sitting the other. What do you think she'll say? He said, it's obvious, she'll sack both of them. And I told that story to somebody else the other day. They said, you're assuming she went up there and not down there. Yes, well, like I said, there's one God. I go to the Church of England every Sunday.